I'll be turning to Romans chapter 8, verse 31. And then my key, key verse tonight will be Acts 20 and 24. And uh, amen. Praise God. Romans 8 and 31. Paul says, I like the inclusiveness of Paul. Paul is letting us know this whole Jesus thing is a we thing. Mm -hmm. You know, we live in a world today, well, I serve my God on my own way. Well, you haven't been reading your Bible. But good luck with that. <laughs> he says, what shall we say? So what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Amen. We get a lot of strength and courage from that. In fact, I would admonish you that when you're going through it, go ahead and pull up Romans 8 and 31 and read that. Amen. I think it's amazing that when you realize what Paul wrote in Romans 7, you put this together and you realize, you know what? A lot of stuff we go through is self-inflicted. But that's also a we thing too. Because we all know we're all our own worst enemy. Are you hearing me? All right, Acts 20 and 24 is where I really want to key off of. This is what really stirred my heart and prompted this message for this evening. Paul speaking, and we're coming. Uh, Paul's been through a lot at this time. And he makes this statement, but none of these things move me. Some of you have been moved today. Fretting, fearing, worrying. Mm -hmm. But Paul goes on, he says, Neither count I my life dear unto myself. Now that don't make sense to a lot of us. But he qualifies it with that comma, so that I might finish my course with joy. I understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. The Bible says people perish for lack of knowledge. You need to understand what's going on. God's still sovereign. He knew what was going to happen today. You didn't. Now you got to decide, are you going to listen to you and fret? Or believe God and have faith? Y'all need to write that one down because you're going to need that come tomorrow. Are you hearing me? Finish my course with joy. And the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus. Lord, we're so thankful for your word tonight. Lord, I need your help. I'm but clay, I'm but dust. What we're going through, what people are going through in their daily lives, Lord, what our country's going and world is going through, everything's way upon us. But let us not forget the course, Lord, the race that you have set before us, that we would finish it with joy. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Amen. You can be seated. That word course literally means the race. It's the same word. The word move, uh, Albert Barnes translates it in his commentary, moves me or alarm me or deter me from my purpose. The Greek, it says basically, I make an account of none of them. Remember the old saying? This is years ago. People said, man, I'm going to write, put you down in my book. In other words, I'm not going to forget you. I'm going to deal with you. That means it was big to you. But when you say, you know, I'm not even going to take an account of you. Not everybody. You know, don't chase every dog that barks. Don't go down every rabbit hole. Are you hearing me? I do not regard them as, as of any moment or as worth consideration in the great purpose to which I have devoted my life. And what Paul is saying, look, I get all this stuff's going on but my purpose is bigger than the distraction. All that being said, what moves you? Trials, struggles, persecutions, pain, hatred, anger. Paul wasn't talking about those things. He said, none of those things are going to move me. My calling is. My purpose is. In fact, he later states in Colossians, he says in chapter 1, verse 23, if ye continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, 
which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is in the heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Notice he said earlier, nothing moves me from my ministry. He's saying here, listen, I'm, well, you need to be grounded. You need to be continue to be settled and not moved. This is my ministry. I'm going to keep preaching no matter what's going on outside. So in all honesty, to be detailed here, there's Paul with a gratitude for salvation. Here's a guy that was on the road of Damascus. Christ's enemy became a member of Christ's family. Paul called himself the worst of sinners, acknowledging that he was unworthy of salvation and undeserving of mercy or favor. And it was the gratitude for salvation that fueled his devotion and dedication to the cause of Christ. What moves you? Paul admonished Timothy to endure afflictions and then he gave the attributes of a faithful follower. He says, thou therefore, speaking to Timothy, you're going to follow my footsteps. I understand. You're going to go through some things. But listen to me. Endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth. I'm not talking about the world. Now, I'm going to say something. Gonna hurt your fear. Some of you got to get past some of that little stuff. If you'll be about what God's called you to do, you won't worry about what you're not supposed to be doing. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who he hath chosen to be a soldier. What moves you? What moves you? Do things move you out of your purpose or do they propel you in your purpose? When you're facing what you're facing with whatever's going on in your life, where financial struggles, emotional struggles, family struggles, relationship struggles, whatever, what is it that motivates you and moves you? There's another time Paul uses the word course, and it's at the end of his life. In 2 Timothy 4 and 7, he says, you know, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course of my race. I have kept the faith. What's your faith in? What moves you? There's a story in Mark chapter 4 that can be paralleled with the life of a Christian, a microcosm, a short parable that we can lay over our lives and realize it's very similar to this. He says in Mark chapter 4, verse 35, and the same day when the even, evening was come, he saith unto them, unto them, let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him, even as he was in the ship, and there was also with them other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. So there's a little water in the boat here, are you hearing me? And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. Isn't that how it feels sometimes? God, where's God? He must be asleep. <laughs> and they awoke him and said unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? Can I get an amen from an honest saint who's thought that thought? Can we be real in here today? Mm -hmm. And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, what manner of man is this that even the wind and sea obey him? Well, we hear Jesus say in verse 35, let us pass over to the other side. Many of us think when we start living for God that it's, it's going to be an easy road. We think, well, if I live for God, it's a fire escape from problems. As soon as I live for God, I'm in his will. He's not going to let nothing bad happen to me. My life, I'm going to be problem free. Jesus is going to stop and eliminate all the struggles because I'm such a saintly saint of God. And God's just going to allow me to levitate above all the problems and all you commoners. And I'm not going to have no issues. But maturity, Christian maturity, quickly lets you know that, you know, that's not true. In fact, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 17 and 18 says, and this may hurt your feelings a little bit, 
but Paul speaking, and when you consider what Paul's been through and how tenacious he was about people living for God and making says, for our light affliction. We've all been there. We've all done it. We start telling of our aches and pains, and someone walks in and goes, oh, what? You want to compare scars? The next thing you know, you feel like a wimp. In fact, Sunday, if Brother Howerton's listening, he, he texted me after Sunday morning service. Man, that was a great message. I wish I'd have manned up, sucked it up, and went to church. Yeah, yeah. Hey, one of the first things that you need in your Christian walk is honesty with yourself. Man, I, 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 I could have done better if I'd have pushed myself because Paul says, for a light of affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us, uh, worketh, for, say it works for me. A far more exceeding and eternal way to go. What's he saying? These light afflictions are going to keep me from my purpose. This is a central theme about Paul. If you're going to read about Paul, you need to know he, this man, he, he was educated. He could have done amazing things for the, the world. He could, he could have done so much. But he said, you know what? I've got a purpose. It's going to work for a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen. Okay, how many have done that? As an American, we can't help it. We're surrounded by things to have, to own. In fact, success is you got to have a house, you got to have a couple of cars, you got a couple of kids, you got to have a dog, you got a cat, you got a fish. You got to have a life insurance. We're so American, we bypass being apostolic. While we look not at who? People that are about the Father's business. While we look not at the things which are seen. Now this, this is where the struggle is. But at the things which are not seen. How many of you have been looking at the things you can't see? I am being facetious, but I'm being honest. It's easy. And even with the current events going on, oh, it's over. And start crying. Really? Can I tell you, can I tell you what it is? This is what the church is for. I, I picture in my mind right now, Brother Carl, listen, no fireman on the planet wants to know a house is on fire, wants to hear that a house is on fire. But if there's one on fire, he wants to know about it. Why? Because he wants to do something about it. The world's on fire. We need some spiritual firemen. We need some people to point the right direction. There are things that are going on. Hey, hey, wait a minute. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. I got to get my vision right. When you get down in prayer, do you have visions of you doing something for God or you're just appeasing a few moments to get up and go about what you always do? Our light affliction, it works for, how does it work for me? Anybody ever worked out? <laughs> Amen to that. Been working this out. But you start out and you get to the point where you build yourself up. Years and years ago, I got really tremendously ill. Was in the hospital, almost died, and I remember the first time I stepped on the treadmill that we had. I lasted 30 seconds. Now, I'd been in the hospital for some time, devastating, serious situation. 30 seconds, just at the slowest walking. I ended up in the fetal position on a linoleum floor, sitting there going, oh my God. Two years later, I could do 15 miles. I didn't do it the first day, and I can't do it today, but I did it after building it up. You understand what I'm saying? So what are our light afflictions for? Ah, there we go. Psalms is strengthening us what? To be more worldly or to be more godly? The Psalms, he says, Psalms, Psalmist says it like this in Psalms 119, 67. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now have I kept thy word. We need afflictions to remind us what's important. Yes. Now, I don't know if you think this way, but I hate wasted days. And you know what always reminds me of that? Days you're too sick to do anything. And you think, man, this is real sick. I'm bad. I'm not going to let a cold stop me next time. 
I'm not going to miss out on nothing just because I got a little twin cheer or twin. How many of us miss out when you really could do it, but you take a day off, then you get really sick, like, wait a minute, now I need to be down. Why was I down for that? Because listen, before I was afflicted, I went, I don't want to be astray. I want to be about my purpose. There's a lot of distractions, a lot of things to keep you busy, but what's your purpose? I don't want something to move me out of my purpose. I want to see that unseen thing that God is doing to move me in my purpose. What moves you? You know, we see a lot with our young people. Mature people consider consequences. The immature flirt with disaster. <laughs> the Bible goes on to say in Job, Job says in Job 14 1, man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. That kind of, kind of ominous, Job, but if anybody could say it, he can. James goes on in chapter 4 and four, uh, verse 14, he says, Whereas ye not know what shall be on tomorrow. And this kind of coincides with the days when you're, you don't feel good and the days that you're sick. I don't feel good. You don't miss out on life because you don't feel good. Miss out when you're bedridden. Push yourself. It, it, it's it, it's kind of like, and I said this the other day, I think I said this the other day, I know it was part of my notes, that there was this, this, this war, this, it was Mogadishu, uh, when, uh, when the helicopters were shot down, all this crazy stuff, and there's a soldier sitting there going, when the, sorry, the captain or whatever told him to get in the Humvee and drive it, and he said, but I've been shot. And the guy looked at him, we're all shot. Get in there and drive. <laughs> we're all wounded. We're all hurt. Suck it up, buttercup. This is where we're at now. We're, we're all disappointed. We, we, we all got disappointed. We all got issues. We all got, yeah, I can't go to church. They offended me. They didn't call me. Did. did you call them? When you stand before God, you're going to be surprised the little things that cost you eternity. We can't let light afflictions and little things destroy us and move me out of our purpose. We need to, wait, if we realize that there's an unlovingness in the church, be the love. If you know so well to criticize, you should know so well to teach. That's right. That's right. Come on. Oh, yeah. If you want to get a sit back there, they got to do this. Gotta... Hey, we're all from Missouri. Show us. Uh -huh. That's right. <laughs> right? Whereas you not know what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. You got but a moment. To fulfill your purpose. To do what God's called you to do. So like that account in Mark, when we get in the middle of the journey of life, we have to realize there are storms. There are squalls and storms and, and great storms, little storms and big storms. The winds and the waves beat against our life, our boat. We wonder just like the disciples, where is Jesus where is Jesus in my mess? Is he asleep? Wait a minute. I thought he'd keep me from storms. No, he might just be waking you up to your purpose because you're coming down to the end because it's just a vapor. You're here for a moment. Master, don't you care that I perish? More than you know. I don't want you to perish. And you're wasting your time chasing this and you're wasting your time chasing that. You're wondering if I was asleep. You didn't know where I was. But you weren't paying attention to Jesus. You were doing your own right. thing. And it took the storm for you to call on him. Right. Jesus stood up in the midst of the storm. And he stands up in the midst of our problems and says, peace, be still. Now listen, sometimes he'll calm the external storm. But most of the time he wants to calm the internal storm. Because there ought to be something about us that we're not moved by all this. Oh, I'm talking to the mature Christians right now. I get it. There's a problem. I get it. There's things going on. But my mission is bigger than that. I'm aware of that. But that's not going to move me off my mission. In other words, peace be still. And even the winds and the waves of our problems obey him. 
So from that story in Mark 4, we realize a number of things. Jesus wants us to get to the other side. He wants you to make it. John 14, verses 1 through 3, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, but I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, ye may be also. Don't you want to be where he is? Yes. Don't let these light afflictions distract you. Oh, I can't make it to church. I can't make it to pray. I can't do this. I can't do that. Wait a minute. What's your purpose? You're not going to drown. Your boat's not going to sink. He's in your boat. I read a, a portion of this last Sunday. They that go down to the sea in ships that do business in great waters. These see the works of the Lord and his wonders and the deep. For he commandeth and raiseth the stormy wind, and which lifteth up the waves thereof. They mount up to heaven. They go down again to the depths. Their soul is melted because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at their wit's end. You're at the end of your knowledge. Are you hearing me? Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble. That's what your trouble's for, to remind you, I'm going to trust God in this. I'm going to get back to my purpose. I'm going to get back to what's important so that the waves thereof are still. Then are they glad because they be quiet. So he bringeth them unto their desired haven. God wants you to finish. He wants to get you all the way home. Jesus never promised us a trouble-free life. He did say, things I have spoken unto you that in me ye might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. We're going to have problems. We're going to have trials. Things aren't always going to go our way. But the difference is that Jesus is there. He will help us to overcome them. Many times people go on, on and on in the same trial because they don't learn the lesson. If you haven't moved in the things of God in a while, what's moved you out of your purpose? We're going to have problems. We're going to have trials. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. Psalms 34, 19. Psalms 30 and 5 says, Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Paul said in the Bible and encouraged us to endure hardness. Literally means to suffer evil as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. In fact, he said, it, he said uh, Ma, uh, Jesus said in Matthew, he that endureth to the end shall be saved. We got to stay in the boat. One of my favorite speakers, leaders, forgive me tonight for bringing it up, I didn't think about it till now, political figures, is Winston Churchill. And having lived in Great Britain, I spent a lot of time studying about him in school. But he gave some inspirational words to Britain while they were under the most blistering attack by Nazi Germany. It wasn't complicated didn't take a whole lot to decipher what he meant. He didn't fill it with flowery words. He simply said, don't ever, ever, ever give up. We are admonished to the same degree in the word of God. In Luke chapter 9, verse 62, he says, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. What moves you? What moves you? Paul compared the Christian life to a race. And when he said, when he talks about moving you and he talked about course, it literally means race. He says, wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin. Notice he said the weights first. Mm -hmm. And the sin which does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race 
that is set before us. I believe Paul understood this. I believe he had a, 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 a deep ingrained conviction here because when he talks to Timothy, when he's talking to those in, in Rome and those in, 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 in Corinth, Corinth, he makes, he alludes to this. He, in fact, Paul wasn't too varied in what he spoke about. It was very simple. Stay in the fight. Finish your core. Keep the faith. That's what he said. Let us run the race with patience, the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author, listen to me, and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of God, uh -huh. the throne of God. He talked of finishing his course, which goes back to our initial text. And now behold, I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me, but none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course, my race, with the joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. It makes sense then as he winds down and he's speaking to Timothy and in his second letter to Timothy, he says, Timothy, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. But speaking to this young man, he says, and not to me only, but to all them that also love his appearing. When John wrote to the seven churches in Revelation, he repeatedly we, he used phrases like, he that overcometh, or to him that overcometh. He talks about, look, there are things in life. There are things that are going to come into your life, good things and bad things, storms and trials, sunny days and cold days. You've got to decide what moves you. In 1 John chapter 2, we read, you have overcome the wicked one. In Acts 27, we find another story about boats. And after they had set out, a strong wind and storm arose. The people on the boat started throwing the cargo overboard. The weights. There's a storm, church. There's some weights that I need to get out of my life. There are some things that are not conducive for what I'm going. I, I need to lighten my boat so that I'm focused on my purpose. The, the crew on the boat were so fearful that they were all, dare I say it, fasting. Paul saw an angel, told him, fear not. Fear not. Really? It's distracting me from my purpose. If God is so intent and in tune with your life, the storm's not gonna, ma not gonna matter, that he'll send an angel to speak to you, I think you can stand there with some boldness. Okay, God's got this. Mm -hmm. Paul promised all the others on the boat that none would be lost, but you gotta stay in the boat. You gotta stay with the boat. He said, except these abide in the ship, you cannot be saved. Can I tell you, the church is a battleship, yes, sir. not a cruise ship. That's right. That's right. That's Are you on the right ship? What moves you? What moves you? What is moving you? Waddy Piper wrote a book, an interesting children's book, and I won't need to go too deep into this because most of you know it. It's entitled, The Little Engine That Could. Children's favorite. I remember reading it. I still remember the little uh, golden book view of the little engine. Adults can also learn something, a valuable lesson from this book. 
this little train wanted to climb the mountain to take the toys to the children on the other side. But it needed an engine to pull it over the mountain. First off, there was that really lovely fine engine. It was asked to help but refused because it only pulled passenger trains full of people. Refusing to be daunted, the train petitioned a freight engine. And the freight engine refused because it only pulls trains full of big machines. And it was tired from a previous trip. A train still wanting to make the journey over the mountain inquired of a rusty old engine. Please, kind engine, won't you pull us over the mountain? The old engine said, no, nah, I've been doing that long enough. I'm too old and very tired, and I cannot. Finally, the little train saw that little blue engine. It didn't have much strength, but the little train asked anyway. Little engine, can you help us over the mountain? To this, that little engine replied, you know, I've never been over that mountain, and I don't have a lot of strength, but I'll try. What moved you? As the little engine pulled the train up the mountain, he repeated to himself, I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. Focused on the mountain. Focused on a one track. My, a one track. My, I think I can. I think I can. I, think I can. I, I get up in the morning, I think I can. You, you're going through storm and the weight seems heavy, but I think I can. I think I can. And slowly, slowly, the little engine, the, the one that was overlooked for all the, the big shots and nose doing all these other things, slowly went over the top of the mountain and started saying, I thought I could. I thought I could. I, I thought I could. I thought I could. What moves you? Those that think I can and those that think I can't are usually both right. The other engines in the story had the same disease as the ten spies in Numbers 13 who said, we cannot. What moves you? Those other two spies had a different attitude and said, we can't. Let us do it at once. It's the same with Daniel and the three Hebrews. Everybody else was doing the wrong thing. They said, I'm going to do this thing. What moves you? There are those who refuse to quit. And there are those that will never give up. This is the plight of the kingdom of God. And it's found throughout scripture. What is found in you? What moves you? You, Because when the Israelites looked at Goliath, they said, we cannot. David agreed, I cannot, but my God can. Paul constantly faced overwhelming odds. But it was Paul who also said, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth, no, Philipp, strengtheneth me, Philippians 4.13. Years ago, and being a former, believe it or not, I don't look at it now, former marathon runner, it was a basic story took place in Mexico City, the Olympics in 1968. During the marathon, an Ethiopian by the name of Dagagamama Hold had won the marathon race. He finished in two hours, 20 minutes, and 26 seconds. The crowd was thrilled. They cheered for him as he ran through the opening of the arena and crossed the finish line. Other things were going on, and the crown lingered and waited for the last of the runners to come. It was getting dark, and one by one, they started leaving the stadium. As more and more gathered to leave, all of a sudden, there was some noise and commotion approaching the opening of the arena. They heard sirens and turned and watched a lone figure, the last runner, followed by police and other emergency vehicles of that 26 mile race. This runner was from Tanzania. You could obviously see he was badly hurt. A man by the name of John Stephen Akari had earlier in a collision with other runners at the 19th kilometer 
fell, dislocated his knee, gashed his leg, damaged his shoulder in a fall. Got up, and rather than quitting, limped, hopped, trotted, did everything he could do to finish the race. And as he entered the arena, badly limping in an obvious pain, the race long over, the crowd viewed and realized what was going on as this injured, injured runner had not given up despite his overwhelming injuries, started to cheer. Started to applaud. Cheering in the stadium erupted in applause when he finally limped across the finish line in three hours, 25 minutes, and 27 seconds. A TV news crew was dispatched quickly to ask him, why did he just quit? He couldn't win. The, the race was lost. He made a statement. He said, my country did not send me to Mexico City to start the race. They sent me to finish the race. <laughs> what moves you? What motivates you? What stirs you? I can be honest, transparent, but I'm as disappointed as a lot of people about what goes on in our world but I don't want that to move me. I can honestly say I want the Spirit of God to move me. In fact, I, I want to be like Jeremiah no matter what's going on. I want a fire shut up in my bones that moves me. I want a burden to move me. I, I know there are things in this life to do, but I want to, the, the, the Word of God to move me, a burden to move me, a commitment to move me, conviction to move me, love and faith, and the things of God to move me. Some of us are moved by the wrong things. Don't let disappointments and sin move you to tears. Let it move you to purpose. Let it, let it move you to an unction of what we're here for. Let's all stand. I'm going to close. I recently read of a story about a movie that I watched as a kid growing up. It affected me. It's, I have found that my things that move me are always comeback stories. The against all odds. You know, being the black sheep of the family, the only boy, the one that had to get in the back with the dog in our simulated sided station wagon in the 70s. You know, the, the odd one out. There's been something that between England overcoming its Nazi onslaught to movies like this. But this story just grabbed me and I want to just share it with you. But there's a story that's told that during the filming of Ben-Hur, Charlton Heston had a problem learning how to drive the chariot. Now, he was expected to drive the chariot in a race. But he went to William Wyler, the director, and he said, listen, I think I can drive the chariot, but, I, but I'm not sure that I'm going to be able to win the race. The director responded, you stay in the race, and I'll make sure you win. kind of reminds me of our deal with God. We have an author and a finisher. We have a director. You stay in the race and I'll make sure you win. We got a God that says, you stay in the race and I'm going to make sure you win. I'll, it doesn't matter if people count you out. I'll make sure you win. Stay in the race. Stand about what moves you. I want to be moved by the things 
of God. Stay in the race. Stay in the boat. When he told the disciples in Matthew 28, 19, he Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever commanded you. And he said, Lo, listen, listen, folks. I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. <laughs> the storm don't run them out of your life. The storm doesn't say he's left you. He's the author and the finisher. You stay in the race, and I'm going to make sure you win. So not only is he with us to the very end of the world. Hey, folks, you're going through something. I don't want to hurt your little feelings, but why don't you say to your neighbor that's going through something, it's not the end of the world. And even if it was, Jesus is still with you. And I close with this. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Jesus is going to make sure you win. Just don't quit. Just don't quit. What moves you tonight? Let's talk to the Lord right now. What moves you? Listen, folks. Hallelujah. I'm not saying the pain's not real. I'm not saying the struggles, nothing to think about or deal with. It is. And I want to say this. America is a beautiful country. But it does not compare to the golden shore of heaven. And he wants to get us to the other side. I'm going to stay in the boat. I'm going to get to the other side. Where there's no more sorrow, where there's no more pain, where there's no tears. Hey, thank God for America, but I got a better country. I got a golden shore to make. I'm going to stay in the rain. What moves you? I'm going somewhere. I got a finish line to cross. I got a finish line to cross. I'm going to stay in the fight. And he's going to make sure I win. Glory to God. Look at your neighbor and say, stay in the fight, we win. Stay in the fight, we win. And be not weary, well doing, for you shall reap if you faint not.